So we are in the book of First John. So you can open that to chapter four. And uh, and you know what? You just never know what God's going to do. Last, uh, um, you know, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is fear and how perfect love casts out fear. And, you know, one of the things was, for some reason, man sat, I mean, I, huh, I was, I don't know if it was spiritual oppression or whatever it was, but the, the enemy was so against getting the word out last week I, I just said to my wife, I, I, just, I just can't do this, man. I can't. It's not coming together. I don't understand it. It's, you know, this was like at about midnight after I had been up since 3.30 in the morning working on it until midnight. And I thought, oh, man, I just can't do it. I said I would just pay somebody. I would write them a personal check for 500 bucks if they would just teach for me Sunday. This was last week. And, you know, and I was like, okay, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. And somehow, man, it was just such an anointed service. It was such an anointed time. It was such a blessing. It was so fun, so cool, so amazing. And that just shows us that we just need, or at least shows me, that we just need to trust in the Lord regardless, right, of how we feel, right? Regardless of what we're thinking in our minds, letting those thoughts go, go through our heads, we just need to trust the Lord. And the, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit was just on. It was just an amazing time. And, and it's just, again, we just have to trust Him and continue to do what He's called us to do no matter what. Now, last week we talked about this. If you can hit the lights, Chris, unfortunately they didn't change those two front lights, so I have to employ you today. All right, so we are in chapter 4 in the book of 1 John, and again, it's a book of tests to show us where our hearts are really at. And then we had tests of fellowship in the first few chapters of obedience, uh, if we're really following the Lord, uh, or are we putting on a show? A doctrinal tests, discernment tests, and then the love test, as we were talking. This is our third love test in chapter uh, 1 and 2 was the first two, and chapter 3, uh, excuse me, in chapter 4, we talked about this is really uh, the big love test, and love is a compass that shows us really how we're doing uh, in our life. It, it, it guides us. It, it, the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, it will guide us what to do, what we should say, what we should not do. We talked about how we need to do everything in love in 1 Corinthians 6.14. That means the, the easy stuff. That means the hard stuff. Everything that we do should be done in love. That means the job that you do. That means the school that you go to. That means the relationships that you're in. That means the finances. Everything should be done in a response to God's love for you. And because of God's love for you, it pours out to others. We talked about, even though 1 Corinthians 13 is called the love chapter, right? Everyone knows that as the love chapter. And there are things we talked about where God wants us to do, right, on the left. And the things that love says, no, I'm not going to do these things, okay? That even though this agape love that uh, God talks about, in 1 Corinthians 13, in first, and he talks about it roughly eight times in that whole chapter. In this chapter 4 that we've gone in just in these few verses that we covered last week and this week, it appears 27 times. So this is really the challenge for us. We talked about how uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, we went through 7 through 16, how he starts off saying, agapetos, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's calling you you. He's calling me. He's calling us beloved, loved ones, favorites, worthy of love, esteemed. That should blow your mind because it's the exact same word that God used in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, when he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Can you receive that love? Do you receive that love? Do you understand the love that God has for you? It should blow our minds. But he calls you, he calls me. Okay, let's just leave you aside. He calls me beloved. Isn't that amazing? Crazy, Crazy right? 
That is so, but that's his love for us. It's a crazy love. It's an amazing love. And he says to let us, from the beginning of that Bible, you see that heart of words right there? From the beginning of the Bible to the end, it's a story of love, that God's love towards us. And he wants us, because he loves us so much, that we should go and love others. That should be the supernatural, natural response of God's love for us. We talked about that everyone who loves has been born of God with that agape love and lives that life loving from God to others and knows God. And that should radiate out from us just because of the Holy Spirit living inside. In fact, the Bible says that we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. And anyone who does not love in that agapitos way remains in death. So that's going to be the fruit of God's Holy Spirit in your life. It's not going to be how much doctrine you know or Bible or whatever. It's the love God has. We talked about that whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. We also talked about how that's not the only thing he is. He is also holy. He's also almighty. He is also everlasting, king, omniscient. He's also light, and in him there's no darkness at all. He's also a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, and how our God is a consuming fire. And, and we talked about how even though God's love today is so amazing, we talked about this, and most people... When we talk about the love of God for us, and I, I, I don't know if what the blockage is or if we're just so self-centered, because I know for a long time I was, but even though he demonstrated his love for us on that cross, most of us are almost like, hey, selfie with Jesus. Dying on the cross. Yep, Jesus loves me. Next meme, next text, next website. And we miss the whole point. But God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's how much he loves you. And because he loved us, because we're called beloved, God so loved us, we also to love one another. So now we are in 1 John chapter 16, verse 17. And Chris, if you can hit the lights for a second. We're going to read this together. Uh, we talked about verse 16, but I didn't finish it, so 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, I'm going to read uh, 16 through 21, actually. It starts off this, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If anyone says, hey, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this commandment, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So here we are. I wanted to go into chapter 5 too, but we're just not going to make it. So the first thing I want to do in verse 16, I want, the first thing I want to do is I want to start us off with a question, okay? And I want you to think about this, all right? All right? Your Bible, does anybody have in verse 16, does anybody have anything different than know and rely? Does anybody have anything different? Your, does your translation say anything different in verse 16? What is it? Know and believe. Know and believe. Okay, anything else? Mine says we have come didn't know it before, but yes. we are in the process of knowing. Yes, good. Yes. Mine says we know how much God loves us. Yes. Okay. Well, that's good. All those are good. Because here's the thing. If you could hit the lights for me, Chris. Thank you. Here's the thing. Here's the question for us. And, and I think we all need to ask ourselves. And, and I can't answer this for you. I can only challenge myself with it. You have to challenge yourself with it. 
Do you know, and if you have, you do that side of thing, I would underline the no in verse 16, or the rely on, or trust in, or believe in. But do you know and rely on the love God has for us? That's important. Do you know the love God has for you? The word in, in Greek is, is gnosko, and that means like... I don't even know how to say it, like an experiential. <laughs> I, I know it more than just an intuition. I, 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 I'm, I'm certain of it. I, I know it. The word rely in Greek uh, is uh, pistuo, and it means to be, uh, to believe. It means to be persuaded of, to entrust, or to trust in. So do you know intimately Sometimes that word gnosko is even used of a marriage relationship, an intimacy and marriage relationship. Do you know what I'm saying? It means an intimate knowledge of that love. Do you know it? Do you rely on it? Do you, are you persuaded of it? Do you trust in it? Does that make sense? Do you trust in his love? Because how you respond is super important. It actually will alter the course of your life. Listen, some... Uh, I've noticed over the years, doubt his love. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I've watched a lot of people, uh, and I think, now listen, can we all have doubts sometimes about God's love? Right? Can't we? Okay. So we can all do it sometimes, but is that the main thing? Do you doubt that God loves you? Because if so, that's not a good thing. Like it's kind of, it would go like this. It would, it would go like this. Lord, I, I know you love us, but I, 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 I know you love her and her and him. But, but I don't, I mean, how could you just love me? I, 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 their souls, the pastor's so spiritual. The, the, this person, that person, whoever, but me, I, I, I don't see how you can love me. Because that's going to influence your whole life. Some kind of fear his love. It's, it's kind of a weird thing. It's almost like here's the creator of the universe reaching out to save us, to pull us up from the muck and the mire. And some of us are like, hey, listen, I, I don't want anything to do with it. He might change my life. Uh, I might have to do some things that are difficult. And uh, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I know whatever he's trying to save me from, from hell. And, you know, and, and, and he's got a plan for me and a purpose. But, you know, I, I, I just, I don't want to change my life. I, 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 I want to stay right where I'm at. And sadly, they, they, they fear God's love. It, it's, it's sad. It, some people respond in an arrogant way. And maybe you've heard this. Like people will say something like, um, uh, yeah, you know what? When I see the man upstairs, when I get up to heaven, I'm going to tell him a few things. <laughs> Am I right? Let me tell you something. When you come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the only thing you're going to be able to do is to get on your knees and humbly say, oh, my Lord and Savior, mercy. You're not going to tell him nothing. Hopefully, you'll realize now that you, me, we, we are desperate sinners in need of an amazing Savior. Amen? Amen? If you don't, you're going to be standing before him, and it's going to be too late. There's going to be sheep and goats. One is going to go off to eternal life, and the other one to eternal punishment. Wow. So let's not, some are arrogant about his love. Some are actually sinful about his love. I see this a lot in churches today where, well, you know, God loves me. So, you know, pretty much I can do whatever I want. Am I right? You know what I'm saying, right? That's the whole wrong attitude in our hearts and lives. So we can't have that attitude in us. We can't have, that's a wicked attitude. So, Maybe I should reverse it, and we should do it a little differently. If you can hit the lights for me. Thanks, Chris. Maybe I should do it a little differently. See, a born-again Christian must know and believe the love, God, the love that God has for us. So I want you to ask yourself one more question. You don't have to answer it out loud. This is just for you personally. Okay? I want you to think about this. Ready? Here, here's the question. What would it take for you... 
for you to stop believing that God loves you? I won't answer it. I just want you to think about it. What would it take for you to stop believing that God loves you? Maybe it would be a relationship that goes south. I've watched a lot of people, their whole world falls apart because a relationship falls apart. Maybe it's uh, a big financial crash, a financial loss, you know, and all of a sudden, I, I, God doesn't love me, you know, and maybe it's, it's cancer. Maybe it's cancer. And somebody gets diagnosed with, with cancer. Or, or maybe COVID. Oh, I guess God doesn't love me. He's blessing somebody else. It's not me. What is that thing? What would it take for you to stop believing that God loves you? Because whatever that is in your mind, whatever you thought of in your own heart and head, that's a little idol that needs to come down in Jesus' name. Whatever that is, is a hindrance to you. It's blocking your faith. It's blocking your trust in Him. It's blocking your belief in Him. Does that make sense? Whatever that is, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would ask your Heavenly Father to crush that in the name of Jesus so that that love can flow flow freely into you and then through you because you know what because whatever that is whatever that might be that happens okay whatever it is is not only blocking God's love in your heart but also blocking the love to flow out into other people's lives does that make sense does everybody understand that Charles Spurgeon said something um, that I, I, I like. And, and we're living in a time, listen, I love God. I love the Holy Spirit. And sometimes God is so gracious and I sense his presence and it's a wonderful thing and I could just stay there forever. But you know what, Charles Spurgeon? Oh, Danny, it's wonderful to see you. Here's what Charles Spurgeon said. To feel God's love is very precious. But to believe it when you do not feel it is the noblest. Does that make sense? We need to believe and trust in God's love regardless. Because I think we're also living in a time where we're going to see here very shortly, I don't know if that's five years, ten years, could be two years, uh, an increase in persecution an increase in torment or an increase in you, I, we have to be ready. We have to make sure our faith is real. Do you know what I'm saying? This is not candy land. Do you know what I'm saying? Our faith can't be like cotton candy and, and popcorn and, you know, s smoke machines and woohoo. No, some of you don't. Don't get me mad because I said smoke <laughs> machines. But it could be, but anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not candy land faith. God is wanting to prepare your heart, my heart, our heart, for something that's coming. It will come because the Bible is being fulfilled right before our eyes. You're seeing it. Or if you don't see it yet, let me tell you, I absolutely guarantee you will get to see it. Now listen, the neat thing in verse 16, and it says this uh, in verse 16, we know and rely on the love God has for us. And then it goes on to say, God is love and who, whoever lives in love, excuse me, lives in God and God in him. Now, I love the scripture picture and, uh, because if, if, if God lives in us and we understand that love, it's going to come into us and it's going to change every area of our life. It's going to change how I interact with people. It's going to change how I handle my finances. It's going to change how I, I handle my relationships. It's everything is now to honor him. And so what we are to do, and what, if you don't know, the Bible says we must be born again. So this world is dead. It's dying. Before I got saved, I lived almost 30 years. You know what? I went to church. I did all those things. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm good. I'm pretty religious. I'm more religious than most. Very charitable giver, right? That, I've got some 
I didn't know the Lord at all. I just knew about him. And now, I didn't realize that I was dead. But when I got saved, something happened. He started changing me from the inside out. That's why I'm so excited to be baptizing people here next month. This is, it is next month, right, Pastor <laughs> Next month, that's so exciting. Or, or if you want to renew your faith, you're, you're saying I'm, I'm, you're identifying with Christ and his death going underwater, and you're coming to a new life saying, man, I want it in front of all these people. I want to say I follow Jesus. I don't care what comes my way. I want to follow Jesus. Amen? Amen? And you can do that. All you have to do is ask. We'd be happy, honored to meet with you and talk with you, to make sure you know what you're doing and to baptize you. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 14, 8, if we live, it's to honor the Lord. That means everything you do, every area. There's not certain areas where we're like, I, I, I'll do this for God, but uh, he, you know, I, I'm not going to do this. No. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And wherever you do that, fruit is going to be born. You're going to bring life to other people. to other, It's going to bear fruit that will last, God says. So if we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to? So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Amen? Verse 17. Hit the lights just for a second, Chris. I'm so sorry. Thanks. And is Neely here, or Lisa, or anybody? Else? Okay. Somebody, somebody, remind me of both. Get these lights, get those lights out for next next week. All right. Verse seventeen says, "In this way," or some might trans another translation might say, "This is how love is made complete, or perfect, or or brought to completion among us." By, by living in love, receiving God's love, and then giving it away. My life is not about me anymore and making my kingdom and security for myself. It's about making his kingdom. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and God said all the rest will be added unto you. So let me put him first. And verse 17 says, in this way, love is made complete, perfect, or brought to completion among us so that we can have confidence on the day of judgment. Hey, oh, that was perfect. <laughs> so the first thing it says, so that we could have confidence in the day of judgment if we, as we live this life of love. And, and here's the thing. If you don't know this, if you're watching online or if you're here today, okay, the Bible says this. And if you can hit the light again, Chris, you're getting, you think of the arm workout you're getting. The Bible says it's appointed unto men, and that's women too. That's mankind. Everybody understands this, right? Once to die. But after this, the what? Yes. It's appointed. So if you don't know, there is a judgment that's coming. Okay? And so, Nehemiah, Vinny, you get it? Once to die, then the judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 says this. I saw the dead. This is John speaking. He said, I saw the, day, the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, according, excuse me, as recorded in the books. Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, And whosoever's name was not found written in the book of life was what? Well, that's just a truth. Now, you don't have to go there. I don't have to go there. He's made a way for me to be saved. You see this shirt? What does it say in the front? I'm a whosoever. Absolutely. The back of this shirt says, God, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm a whosoever. Look, look, the Bible is so great. God is so awesome that he reaches down huh, and, and and, and through Jesus Christ, his son, to save us. I love that. Acts 4.12 says this, salvation is found in no one else. For there's no other name. That's the name of who? Jesus. Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given to man by which we 
must be saved. Yeah, man. That we must be saved. Hallelujah. Jesus. The Bible says, and if you don't know this, that Jesus said, he answered a guy by the name of Nicodemus, and he said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born from above, he cannot see even see the kingdom of God. That's John chapter 3, verse 3. But to all those who received him, this is the cool part. You have a choice. He won't make you believe. He won't make you trust. He won't make you receive. Yet, he says in John 1, 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that is what you are, beloved. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want that? Listen, whatever it is that's in the way, blocking that, get rid of it. Get rid of it. He's called us children of God. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he cares about us. That's how much he's concerned about us. We are called his beloved. And I love that. So God wants us to have confidence on the day of judgment, it says here in verse 17. Confidence. And, and here's the thing. Well, as we talk about bearing the fruit of Jesus Christ, of the God's love in us, I um, wasn't sure which one I liked better. I think I went with this one. Okay. As we talk about receiving God's love in our hearts, right? Because we can do that or not. You can say, no, thank you. Don't want it. But if you receive it, then you know what? It's going to go into you and it's going to come right back out. And God's love. And here's the neat thing. It says in Isaiah 32, 17, that the fruit of righteousness, of Christ's righteousness living inside of me, right, is peace. Peace with God and peace from God. And here's the effect of that righteousness, of that fruit being born and that love in our hearts coming from Jesus Christ, from God the Father through Jesus Christ in our hearts out to others. He says the effect of that righteousness will be quietness and confidence. How long? Forever. See, if you believe and receive that God really does love you, if you've really accepted it in your heart, you're going to have confidence. If you're living that way, if you're living a life of love, you know what? You're going to have confidence, not in yourself, right? Because we all know we're wicked sinners, right? I hope you know you're a wicked sinner, right? But we are. But man, if you know Christ Jesus, holy schmoles, his love is coming. Into, we can be confident, not in ourselves, but in him. We don't have to be nervous on the day of judgment. If we're in Christ Jesus, he doesn't want you to be nervous at all. That effect of that righteousness, of that love, is quietness and confidence forever. <laughs> I love this picture. We covered it months, month ago, but 1 John 2.28 says, And now, dear children, beloved, continue in him. And so that when he appears, we may be what? I'll tell you what, why are, listen, can I just, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to say this in the right way. But if you're living this tormented life, God's not the life God has for you. It's either because you're not relying on his love or you got stuff in your life that's not responding to his love in the right way. Okay? That's why you're like that. And you know what I know? Because I was there myself a long time ago. You are miserable. Just take the plunge, my friend. Whatever, Lord. Whether I live or die, just let me honor you. You know, when you get there, there's a certain freedom in that. That no matter what comes your way, you know, well, I'm going to choose. I've chosen to trust in the Lord. He wants us to be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Isn't that a cute picture? You know, we talked a little bit about persecution, but Hebrews 10.35 says something. He says, listen, he says, I don't want you to throw away your confidence. I don't want you to, I, I'm reaching down, I've thrown you the lifeline, you know, and I don't want you to let go. Don't throw away the confidence 
that you had when these difficult times come. It'll be richly rewarded. In, in fact, okay, I'm going off book, but go to the left a few pages and you'll see the book of Hebrews. I'll go to the left, you'll see James, you'll see Hebrews. Go to chapter 10 with me. Let's hear some pages rust rustling. Look it up for yourself. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, since I'm just going off book here. Okay, if you're struggling with stuff, then you need to remember, remember back, Christian, remember when you first got wind that the Lord loves you. When you first understood it. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's say verse 32. And let's just, re just read it if we can. Hebrews chapter 10 starting in verse 32. I'm just going to read. Because he's talking about judgment above. And how hey some are, are going to stop meeting together. And they're going to. And it's talking about judgment and stuff. He says Listen. In verse 32, he says, Remember those early days after you received Jesus or received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. This is no Candyland Christian. Sometimes, listen to this, he's, he's talking to Christ, to Christ, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult, publicly, and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison for their faith is what it means. And you joyfully accepted, listen to this, the confiscation of your property. Woo! And here's why. Because you knew, knew and relied on that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. What is that better and lasting possession do you think he's talking about here? This isn't your best life now. Candyland Christian. Right? That's not what he has for us. Our life, our best life is yet to come. He says this, he goes on to say, verse, I'm going to read 35, 30, it says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Then verse 36 says, you need to what? Persevere. So that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. And then it goes back to he starts saying, hey, don't shrink back. Don't shrink back. So regardless of what comes your way, you and I, God's trying to get you to the point to where we're going to be serious about our faith. That whatever comes our way, as for me and my house, we're going to honor the Lord. Now, I don't know about anybody else's house. I can just do my house. I can preach to your house. I can plead to your house. I can weep for your house. I, I, I can, do you see what I'm saying? I, but I can't choose. That's, you can't even choose, you can only choose this house. Right here, that house. That house, you can only choose for you. Does that make sense? Make that choice. Pastor Gary, do you have, uh, or do I have the mark? Somebody has a microphone? Oh, good, Miss Kind. Thank you. And then, uh, Mark, I don't know if you wanted to say something. I remember you raised your hand earlier. I'm so sorry, I forgot to call on you. Yeah, thanks. It seems like so often when we try question God's love for us, is because we're relying on our feelings. Uh -huh. And we know our feelings can be misleading. Uh, and if you think about it, what we're saying is that my feelings are more important than what God's word says. Yeah. And so in effect, I'm choosing to put myself on the throne and not God. I've become my own idol. And that's really a stupid place to be. Right now, I just picked your little mic drop. <laughs> Good. good. Anybody else? Okay, back over this way and then back over here. Yeah, that's, that's a good word, man. That's a good word. 
is just to take off on what Gary's saying. Um, in this culture, we think with our emotions. And too many people confuse love being an emotion. It's not. It's a decision. It's a yes. commitment. Yes. Everything we've heard so far and everything we will hear after this will say one thing. Love is a decision, a choice, a commitment, not an emotion, something that I feel. Yeah, it's more than that. Good. Yes, right here. To piggyback on that, there's this great line in the song that says, um, love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will, which I love. Um, before, when you had all the ones where you said um, they were uh, afraid of God's love, Okay. The one that said that they feared God's love. Okay. Okay. So I had this thought of how um, I used to be when I was uh, not saved yet. I felt like I feared his love because I felt like it came with all these strings attached. That if I wanted that, then I had to let go of all these other things. And I didn't want to do that. And what's interesting is when I decided to do it, um, for my daughter's sake, honestly, um, when I got further and further away from those things he, he had me let go of, now when I look back at them, I'm like, why did I value these things? These things are trash. They are bad for me. They are bad for other people. There's nothing good in them. It's like I couldn't see it because I was, at that time, it was important to me. Um, but those things that we hold on to that keep us from the Lord, it is just the devil's schemes. Like, trust God. He wrote the whole book. He, it's his game. Trust him and let go of those things. And in time, God will show you that those things were poisoning you and ruining your life. Know and rely on. Amen? Amen. Trust and obey. There's no other way. And let me tell you, we can sing that song. We can say the words. We can hallelujah, praise God, high five it. But when it comes to the rubber meeting the road, it's a challenge for all of us. And you know, it'll be another stretch every time, but that's what he wants us to do because he's preparing us for what's coming down the road. So don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded, God says. And then he says, you know what? He says uh, uh, in verse 17, because so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. He says, because... In this world, we are like him, or so some translations say, as he is, so are we in this world. Okay, now, uh, Lester, I'm going to call on you in just a minute if you're okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to bring that back to him in just a minute. But what he's saying here, okay, he's talking about two things here. He's talking about positionally, he's talking about judgment, and practically, he's talking about love. Because there's some people who are going to say, well, as he is, so I am in this world. So that means I'm a God here on earth, and I can just claim whatever I want, and I get it. Right? Does that seem self-centered, self-focused, or God-focused and others-focused? So what he's saying here, you know, as he is, so are we in this world. Positionally, he's saying that the Lord Jesus is basically, he's kept or he's safe in heaven. The judgment is completely behind him, okay? And so in the same way, so are we in this world, because if we've received and believed on the finished work of Jesus Christ, our sins are put, were put upon him. He's been judged for them. So basically, in that same way, okay, uh, all those finished works, all those sins are upon him. They're judged. We're freed from that judgment. Does that make sense? All of our sins, past, present, and future, are bought and paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Does that make sense? You don't need to fear that judgment. So as he is, so, so are we because of him. And from a practical standpoint, as God so loved Jesus and, call, and calls him beloved, so are we so loved. In John 3, 16, or, or he calls us beloved in, in the book of 1 John. And as Jesus loves the Father, 
and others in this world, so shall we be doing the same. That will give us great confidence because I'm my father's kid. I don't know what you went through or what kind of good dad that you had or terrible dad that you had, but I have a heavenly father that's an amazing father. And he's a good, good father. And he loves me beyond measure. Right? And as, as just as he loves us a son and calls him beloved, he calls me, me, my daddy, my heavenly dad calls me beloved. And he calls you beloved as well. Amazing. Lester, is there anything you want to say particularly about that? Boy, it's so important to take God's word in context. Um, yeah, when <clears throat> we were asked to, to lead a church in, in Zimbabwe and, and there was a, a disciple of a certain Bible teacher who, who took things out of context. And, and what he was saying here is, is taking this totally out of context and saying, as he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. What is Jesus? Jesus is God. Therefore, we are little gods. Yes. We're not little gods. Yes. We don't have our own glory. We have reflected glory of the Christ <laughs> in us. And he, he you know, it, it's when it's here a text, there a text, everywhere a pretext, and any relation to the context, purely accidental, you know, then you can come up with rubbish like this. Yes. So, <laughs> so it's, it's just so important to yes. take God's word in context and rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And so, yeah, that's what we're having today. So, as he is... What? In the context, as he is love, yes. so are we to be radiating his love right. in this world. Yes, without fear of judgment. And that was probably Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagen, oh. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yes, Maybe. I thought so. Yes, do you have something? Go ahead. If you want and, to say something. And while the mic is here, I'd like yes. to say this. I was reminded of the scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where it says this, not to just we oldies like Lester and myself and some others here, but it says, let no man despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believer and one of the things it says in that verse is be a belief example in love and yes. so the young people that are here this is their message too because yes. they are our next generation absolutely praise God amen and so just as, as that is kept in heaven Jesus is saved or kept in heaven honestly if you've given yourself to Jesus Christ it says in first Peter Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It says, To, inherit, to an inheritance that is what? Imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. Okay? You don't need to be afraid for the day of judgment if you have given your heart and life for Jesus Christ, if you're living a life of love in response to God's love for you. You don't. All right, thank you, Chris. Let me hit the light again. Verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. ruh -roh. Okay, so this is one of those, I, I, I've got this question a lot, and uh, I, I, I remember a couple that I, uh, they're not in this church right now, so, but uh, I love them very much, and one believes in the, absolutely in the fear of the Lord, and so everything must be done in that river. Oh, and God is so awesome and incredible. And, and he is those things. He is. But, and, and he was all the way on this side. And, and God is, and we need to fear him. And then I remember the, the, the other ones. Well, no, perfect love casts out fear. So I'm on this side. God is not, we don't need to fear him in that way and have that reverence and all. We can do whatever we want because God loves us and he loves his children and I'm a child of God. And they were completely opposites and they were fighting like cats and dogs. So when I think of the fear of the Lord, I think, well, 
Lester, missionary 47 years, did a sermon on that fear of the Lord. I did a sermon on that. I think even Pastor Gary did a sermon, or Mark, or one of you, on the fear of the Lord. So, so which is it? Are we supposed to fear the Lord? Or is this perfect love supposed to drive out fear? Is fear good or fear bad? And the answer is? Yes. yes. Oh, you guys are so smart. Yes, the answer is exactly yes. What? Twitch, twitch, twitch. Okay, listen. Here's the first part of fear. Okay, there's a, a fear of the Lord. Uh, Psalm 111 says it. I think it's 111.10. Uh, thanks. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So that fear of the Lord, the, the Lord in Hebrew is yirah. And that means an awe of God, an awesome, reverential respect of His power, of His glory, His omnipotence, of His omniscience. It's, 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 it's keeping Him in that rightful position. It's the same thing when the wisest man other than Jesus who ever lived in, in the book of Ecclesiastes says, hey, you know what? At the end of everything, after I consider everything, okay, my whole life, here's what it all comes down to. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. It, there's a certain aspect of the fear of the Lord. And when I say fear, not like he's going to beat the snot out of me, right? That wouldn't be a loving father, right? A loving father might discipline me, right? But the fear of the Lord, the Bible says in Psalm 119, uh, verse 9 or 10, 9, it says the fear of the Lord is pure. It endures forever. So what God is saying there is having that reverential respect for God, okay, helps to keep our hearts and our minds pure. Okay, there's a purifying effect by keeping God in that, in that awesome reverence position. And that says going to endure forever. It says the angels, if you remember, uh, they, they fly in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year King Uzziah died, and, and he stood before the Lord. The train of the Lord filled the temple. And, and it says the angels, they had to shield. They, they flew, with their, and they had to cover their eyes, and they would cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, 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 and the Lord's holiness and his awesomeness, even for them, was just magnificent. And, and the fear of the Lord, that reverence, that awe, has a purifying effect that will endure forever. So there's a healthy aspect of fear that's good for us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's some of the results. This is important because God wants us to have a healthy, the healthy part of the fear. Okay. So here we go. It's not an either or thing. Okay. Proverbs 14.26 says, Whoever fears the Lord has a what? Secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Listen, God is saying, not just for you, for those who fear the Lord, but also for your kids. If you have kids, how precious is that to you, right? Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. So God's saying, look, don't, don't listen to culture. Don't listen to anybody else. Listen to me. If you fear the Lord and reverence and awe me and all my word, huh. I'm going to make it a secure fortress for you and their kids. You'll have a place to run into in times of trouble. Listen, the Lord, it says in Psalm 25, 14, it says the Lord confides in those who fear him. And he makes his covenant known to them. That word in Hebrew, confides, is sowed. And that means share secrets with counsel. It means to have intimate, familiar conversations with. So God is saying the Lord is going to have share his secrets with, have intimate, personal conversation, counsel those who fear him. That's pretty amazing. I want that, don't you? I want to hear his voice. I want him to share everything he has with me. Not only that, listen to this. Psalm 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord, what? Encamps around those who? Listen, have that reverential awe for him. And not only that, but he delivers them. I don't know if you can see the reflection. 
I don't know if you even noticed this. What do you see here? And what do you see here? No? Oh, yeah, you do see the sword. But what else do you notice? Do you see little hands? Like, almost like demonic hands trying to creep in? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. See how she's reading the word? She's getting it in, hiding it in her heart so he wouldn't, she won't sin against him. And he delivers them. That's amazing. That's a wonderful promise. Fear the Lord. Even in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 9, it says the church, well, that was Old Testament, Pastor D. Listen, in the New Testament, Acts 9.31, it says, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace, and it was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and it grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. Now, there's an unhealthy type of fear, okay? The word in, uh, in, in 18, when it says there is no fear in love, and perfect love drives out fear, the, the word is phobos in Greek, where we get our word phobia from, right? Okay? So, uh, we can be, uh, there's an unhealthy fear. Um, that's, and people are phobos or phobiad. There's a lot of phobias. There's arachnophobia, right? Everybody knows what that is, right? S scared of spiders, right? There's uh, acrophobia, right? Scared of heights. Some of us there, yeah? Thalasphobia, scared of dark waters. What is it? Thalasphobia, scared of dark waters. Oh, I never even heard of that. But yeah, you know what? I probably have that on a dive. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there's, um, uh, there's aerophobia, fear of airplanes. Claustrophobia, anybody have that? Fear of... Okay, there's uh, agoraphobia, fear of gatherings. Social, uh, sociophobia, that's another sort of fear of gatherings, you know. Um, I, I, I think I told this story, but, you know, I used to uh, teach at a much bigger place. And you know what I would do before they would, they would, they would have me come out? I, I would actually, and it was always great, but do you know I was especially young in the Lord? Do you know, do you know where I was before they called me out there? In the bathroom. Men's stall hiding. They would have to come in. Pastor D, Sheldar, it's time. All right. Now, I wanted, I felt like I couldn't do that. I felt like I wanted to hide 100%. Now, if I did that, I would not be standing before you today. Some of you are saying, well, maybe that might have not been a bad idea. But others are saying, you know what? I'm so glad you didn't. Right? Because you can bring the word today as we trust in the Lord. But these phobias um, are generally, if, if you don't know, they're, they're self-focused. Do, do you know there's, uh, there's two other phobias? Oh, see if I can remember them. Uh, processing, stand by. I think it's Chris's phobia. Career Chris. Chris, no. Uh, <laughs> that's actually a fear of judgment. And then there's something that I feel is affecting a lot of people today. It's misophobia. M Y, for those of you who know your phobias, M Y S Misa. M Y S A, misophobia. And that's the fear of bacteria, germs, viruses. Right? So, and listen, we, we want to be smart, right? We want to take precautions. I had multiple people say, hey, well, I'm not feeling well today. Okay, so I'm going to stay home just to be safe. You know what? Okay, great. They're watching us online. Wonderful to see you, sort of. Uh, and, and so that's great. But there's a time when those phobias, right, can take control and interrupt what God wants to do. Fear in general is really, that kind of fear is very self-focused, okay? When I have sociophobia or whatever, the fear of speaking in front of people, okay? Now, when I'm, if I were to be gripped by that and not go out, would I be more focused on myself and my feelings? Or would I be more focused on doing what God calls me to do? Myself. See, a lot of those fears, right. Um, when I, if you have acrophobia and you have the fear of heights, you're not thinking, boy, I'm so high up, I'm so worried about all those people. You know what you're worried about? Me! Oh my God, I'm so high! Right? That's 
that's what you're worried about. All these phobias, they're take. Listen, and there are people here. Listen, and again, we want to be wise, smart. Some come with masks. Wonderful. There's no judgment here. Fantastic. Some don't. Wonderful. Whatever you choose, whatever you, the Lord does, be wise about it. Be smart. Don't be foolish. But you know what? There are people who are not here right now because of mysophobia or all these other phobias. And you know what? If we give in to that, then we're acting just like the world. See, you're acting the same way if you give in to these fears. As you're, you're saying that Jesus has just no more power in my life than the, anybody else here. Does that make sense? And let me tell you, my God does have more power. My God does have it. And he will supply all your needs according to his glorious rich, wishes and riches, I should say. And he will pull you through and get you through everything. So don't you be bound up by that fear in any way in Jesus' name. Does that make sense? Okay, we got a comment over here. Uh, I don't know where the uh, mic is. Lester, are you hogging the microphone back there? Yep. Oh, actually, maybe that was Peggy. Peggy. Ooh. I remember when uh, COVID first started and I was blessed to be able to bring a message to the people and there were a lot of people that were afraid and there's an acronym for fear f-e-a-r is false evidence appearing real and the father's answer is trusting him that's faith yes. so if we have false evidence that's appearing real we need to understand that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we have to trust the Lord. Be wise. Don't be foolish. Right? Don't be a knucklehead. But you know what? We need to respond in faith and trust him. Right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, we're going to spin off. Is there, a, is there a way of getting people who have that terrible fear past it? That's a great question. Uh, you know what? There are some things that we can do. Um, I know of people in the church that. Yeah, have yeah, that, right, right. It. You know what? And, and here's the, the main thing is, or again, being wise, but honestly, the main thing is. You have to, I have to, we have to understand that every hair on your head is numbered. Even Pastor Gary's. <laughs> That's easier to count. <laughs> no, I just meant everybody. I just, what? What? I just, oh, I'm on my way. <laughs> oh, that was brutal. <laughs> Touche. That's you, Brute. But, but you know what? The bottom line is, every, he, he, it's, it's not like there was a, a wonderful uh, pastor who just went to be with the Lord. Um, he passed away in another church we love. We love him. And, uh, and uh, he just passed away. Now, uh, when he died, he was a man of faith. Okay? And, and he just passed away uh, here locally. Now, uh, God's not like, oh my goodness, pastor, I didn't expect you for another 10 years. What in the world happened? Do you think God was like that? Or does he know the day and the hour? Listen, again, don't be foolish. Don't test the Lord your God. Oh, since he knows the day and the hour, I'm going to jump in front of a truck today. Pastor said, do not test the Lord your God. Okay, so don't be foolish with it. But again, you don't want to be gripped and burdened and consumed with that, do you? He doesn't want that for you. Listen, our, when we, we, we consider fear that's self-focused, and we fear, if we think there's stuff in our past, it haunts us, okay? And, and here's the thing, like if we think of the love of God, God showed his love. Would you hit the lights for me, Chris? Thanks. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Okay, he already showed that. So if, if that fear is rooted in the past, 
Remember, he already demonstrated when you wouldn't bend your knee, when you wouldn't give God a second look, when you were a complete rebellion against him. He still died for you and loved you that if one day you would choose to believe in him, you would have eternal life. So don't let those that past haunt you. It doesn't need to. He died for those sins. And sometimes if it's in the present, that's fear, it's immobilizing. But as a Christian, listen, I want to tell you what the Word says. This is in 2 Timothy 1.17. For our God has not given us a spirit of fear, Amen. but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And some translations will say self-control or self-discipline. In other words, I'm not going off my feelings. I have self-control. I have self-discipline. I'm going to do what I need to do. And some people, their fears are rooted in the future. What's going to happen to me? What if I, if I die? You know, well, oh, I can't go out. I can't do this. I can't do that. And listen, I get it. Those are real fears. They're difficult. I, I can struggle with them too. But I'm not going to be held back by them. I don't want to be, right? I want to step out in faith. Listen, what, what would happen to me if, huh, First Corinthians, yes, it looks like a coffin for a reason. First Corinthians 15, 55 to 57 says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is law. But thanks to God, be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ. We don't have to fear the grave. Gary, how long have I been teaching, Pastor Gary? Uh, 61 minutes. Oh, my gosh. You're <laughs> <laughs> is that a record? It's OT. Three minutes, three minutes, give me three minutes, three minutes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Chris, lights. No, you shouldn't say take five, because then I hear take ten. No, okay, so don't panic, nobody panic, we're, we're out of here, okay? Don't panic, don't you dare shake your head at me. Hey. Okay, look, verse 18 says, fear has to do with punishment, okay? A perfect love drives out fear. That's that kind of fear, right? That fear of death. That fear, hey, I don't have to fear even death. What's the worst that can happen to you is actually the best thing that can happen if you're a Christian because you're with the Lord. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Talk about a reverse Uno card. <laughs> Wipe every tear from your eyes. No more pain. No more sorrow. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, right? Yep. And that word punishment in verse 18 or torment, uh, that's... Uh, Colossus, and it means, it does, it means punishment, it means torment, and it's only used one other place in the Bible, and it has to do with judgment, right here. It says, in, in, this is in Matthew 25, 46, and they will go away to eternal punishment, same word, but the righteous to eternal life. So we don't have to have that kind of fear of, of that torment, that judgment, because we have the love of Jesus, and we rely on him and trust in him. Amen? Listen, the Bible says this. Here's a few more, Chris. If you just real quickly, I'm going to put the pedal to the metal. Romans chapter 8, 15, like I did that on the sign. The spirit you received as a, as a born-again Christian does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. He doesn't want you living in fear. If you're doing that, you're not being obedient. And I say that in a loving way, not in a condemning way. He says, rather, the spirit you received brought about by your adoption, he adopted you to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Zephaniah 3.17a says, With his love he will calm, I don't know if you can see it, all your, fears. all your fears. He will rejoice over you with faithful sounds. Then the next, verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. That's a quick question for you. Can you say that you love Jesus? Are you embarrassed to say it? No. Are you? Can, can you just say it? Say it right now out loud. Say, I love Jesus. Right. Say it again. I love Jesus. Listen, if you can't say it here amongst the brethren, you're in trouble. Don't be ashamed of him. Charles Spurgeon said, I can't imagine a true man saying I love Christ, but I do not want others to know that I love him, lest they should laugh at me. That is, that is a reason to be laughed at or rather to be wept over. Afraid of being laughed at? Oh, sir, this is an indeed a cowardly fear. And I'm going to spare you this one for time's sake. The next verse says, verse 20, only two more verses. If anyone says, I, oh, wait a minute. We love him because he first loved us. 
here. Here's what real love is. I don't know, Chris, sorry. This is real love. First John chapter four, verse 10. Not that we loved God. We're never going to do enough stuff to get to him. Right? We'll never do enough good works to cross this great chasm. But this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and provided a way to be saved and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. That's real love. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the next verse here, in chapter, 1 John chapter 4.20, whoever claims to love God, yet hates his brother or sister, is a liar, liar, pants on fire. You're it's hypocritical. You're wearing a mask. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have seen. The Bible says anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15. I'll skip this one. No, God wants me not to skip it. But anyone, this is 1 John 2, 11. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is in darkness. And they're walking around in darkness because they don't know where they're going. Because the darkness has blinded him. And then the last verse, verse 21 says, And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And you guys already know this. This, first, this is John chapter 13, verse 35. It says, Your love for one another, another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Amen. Let's pray. Okay, thank you guys for being patient with me. Father, I, I just ask, Lord, each person that's here today, and I know there's a bunch of people online today, Lord, I'm asking for you to bless them with a new understanding, a new trust, a new relying on the love that you have for them, Lord God. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that they would know that height nor death nor angels nor demons or nothing can separate them from the love that Christ Jesus has for us, Lord God. And they can believe it. They can rely on it. They can trust in it, Lord God. And whatever is hindering that, I pray in Jesus' name that it would be removed, that it would crumble, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your love can flow freely in them and through them, Lord God. So give them a new understanding of your love. Help them not to, to have the, the harmful kind of fear where we're fearing judgment and punishment and damnation, because that's not what our Heavenly Father is for those who are saved, Lord. Yeah. But help us to have a reverential respect for you, Lord, and awe for you. We love you. And I pray for your blessing to be upon each person here and each person at home, Lord. I love them, and I know you love them a billion times more, Lord God. Bless them in a supernatural way by the power of your Holy Spirit here and at home. In the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being patient. Have a great day in Jesus' name.